Spirit, draw us in past the gates and past the courts into the Holy of Holies, that we may touch on him who transforms us by his touch. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, this afternoon, in this afternoon session, I'm going to, if you like the kind of person who likes a heading, I'm going to speak on unlocking the hidden you. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Are you ready? Okay, Genesis chapter 32. <laughs> you guys all right? Genesis chapter 32. I'm going to read verses 22 to 28. So, background. Just, um, I'm not assuming that everybody's a Bible scholar. But background is we're dealing with Jacob. Jacob, his name means supplanter. His name means thief. Guys, you need to be careful what kind of names you give your children. <laughs> Why would you give your child this name, supplanter, thief? But there you are. That was his name. That was the identity that was placed on him. And let me just say this from the get-go, that we have more than one identity. And sometimes the identity that you are going by is not the real you. Sometimes the identity that you are displaying and that you're going by is something that's been placed on you, but it's not actually you. Or it's a false identity, or it's the negative part of you. So today, we want to talk about taking off that identity that is false and allowing the beautiful person that God created to come forth. Amen? So Genesis chapter 32 finds Jacob um, after he's gone through a lot of issues. But let me read the scriptures, then we'll talk about it. This is on Jacob's journey back to his brother Esau. Um, it says, but he got up that same night and he took his two wives and his two female servants. Aren't you just so grateful to God that we don't get to do this two-wife thing? <laughs> Jeez. Um, and his 11 children. And he waded over the ford of Jabbok. Then he took them and he sent them across the brook. And he also sent across whatever he had. So Jacob was left alone. And a man came and wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched his hip joint. And Jacob's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. Then he said, the man said, let me go for day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing on me. So he asked him, what is your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And the man, Jacob asked the man, please tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask my name? I want you to put that scripture in your pocket and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, and we're going to read verses 13 to 23. This is not about Jacob. This is about Simon. And Simon meets with Jesus earlier, and Jesus looks at him, and he says, your name is Simon, but you're going to be Cephas, Kepha or Peter, whichever way you like to say it. It's the, it's the same name. But let's read this bit. Now, when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, 
He asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or just one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the son of the living God. Then Jesus answered him, blessed, happily, spiritually secured, favored by God. Sometimes amplified is a bit extra, but blessed. Are you Simon, son of John? Because flesh and blood, mortal man, did not reveal to this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of authority of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. Then he gave the disciples strict orders to tell no one that he was Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. It carries on. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples clearly that he must go to Jerusalem and endure many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised from death to life on the third day. And Peter, the one who's just been called the rock, took him aside to speak to him privately and began to reprimand him saying, may God forbid it. This will never happen to you. But Jesus turned aside and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me and you're not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. I'm, I've read you these two stories because I want to focus today on the fact that we have more than one identity. And there's one that is hidden that God sees. And there is one that comes to us naturally. And these guys had two names. Each of them had two names. And names in the Bible, in, uh, throughout the scriptures, names are not just tags or titles. Names spoke of a person's identity. So names were almost like a prophetic declaration of who you are. And people became their name. I think that it, it is quite true to, uh, you know, like when you, when you meet people that are called joy, they're usually joyful. And when you meet people that are, oh, is there a joy? Is she joyful? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And when you meet people that are called peace, they're usually peaceful. When you pe meet people that are grace. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so um, these guys had a name that they went by. And then a name that God called them. And I want to speak over you today that there's a name that you're going by now. But there's a name that God calls you. There is something that God sees beyond the name that you have been given. He sees you in a different light. He sees something that he has planted. And there are two identities. And today we are taking off the old identity and calling forth the name that God has called you for. I call it forth from you today in Jesus' name. So actually in Simon Peter's case... He had three identities <laughs> because he had Simon, God gave him Peter, and then at some point he was Satan as well. You know? <laughs> so, mm. But it just shows that um, we tend to be more than one person. And if you look at your neighbor, there are times when you are brilliant. Even you, when you look at yourself, you, there are times when you're like, go girl, and you're like, yes. And then there are other times that you look at yourself and you're like, really? <laughs> Wave at me if you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah? Um, 
I thought I was the only one who was schizophrenic, the whole lot of it. <laughs> but seriously, Jacob's name meant supplanter or thief. It meant the guy who grabs stuff. Grabber, supplanter. It actually meant that he grabs stuff without even regard for who he's stepping on. And you know what? He was that guy for, for the best part of his youth. He was that guy who was determined to get to the top and he would push whoever is in his way while he gets his pressing for the top. Have you met people like this? Um, like, what matters is I am getting to my goal. If you are in my way, I pray for you. Because I am going to the top. And this was him. He knew what he wanted. And I respect people that knew what they want, what, uh, know what they want. But sometimes that can be overbearing. And it can be... Um, overpowering you. It can be disrespectful of other people. It can be um, lacking compassion of other people. Just going for what he wanted. That was his identity. He was Mr. Grab it. But God bumps into him in the portion of scripture that we have met. So he spends his youth grabbing stuff. In the, in the beginning, he tries to be the oldest child. And he's like, and then his brother beats him to it. And then he spends his youth thinking about his brother's birthright. While his brother is out in the field, he's thinking, I need to study this guy and find out how I can take his birthright away from him. You know, can you imagine that little brother? And he's just, for him, he's so obsessed with this birthright. Unfortunately, his brother doesn't know what he has. And his brother is focusing on life and, and trouble and labor and all of that. But him, he's sitting in the mom's, I, don't, I kind of think that his mom was a party, a little bit of a party to what Jacob came, became. Because mom was like pushing him to become something more than he was at that point. So trick number one, he watches his brother, he, he finds out what his brother likes, waits for his brother. When his brother is tired, he gives him a bowl of soup and he says, give me your birthright. And his brother, Da, exchanges his birthright for a bowl of soup. And then as if it wasn't bad enough, he does it a second time. When their dad is dying, um, he's just waiting. Well, just before, this time it was fully mom's fault. Mom said, you go dress up, look like your brother, smell like your brother, and go and get your brother's blessing. And so he did that. He went, faked his brother's voice, faked how his brother looks, and he took the blessing. Taking from his brother, ruptured their relationship. So he, the, you see the problem with ambition and, you know, ambition's good, but the problem with ambition is that it ruptures relationships. So it can be very harmful. So he ends up, and how many of you know that you, you gather things and you gather things and you gather things and then at the end of the day, you look at the things you've gathered and you're not happy. So when we come to this portion of scripture, he has gathered stuff. He's got his brother's first blessing. He's got the blessing of the dad. He's got not just one wife, two wives. He's got cattle. He's, he's in the physical, he's blessed, right? If blessing means having stuff, he has stuff. But he also has a broken relationship. He has no communication with his family. Remember, there was no Facebook, no phones. He has not been in touch with his family for years, 20 years. He's been separated from his family. He has a brother, his only brother 
his twin brother, you know how tight twins can be. He's not spoken to his twin brother for 20 years. And the Lord says, go back. Because, you know what? I can do something with you, but we need to sort out this Esau issue. So he's on his way back, and he's frightened. How many of you have ever fallen out with somebody, and you know that journey of trying to go back to make amends? It's Everything is beating, your heart is beating, your stomach is running. He's in that state. And then in that state, God comes and he bumps into him. And they have this encounter. It's just amazing because the Bible says that a man comes. There's no description of this man. It isn't like angels stand there and say, that man is the man who has your blessing. He's the one who you need to struggle with. He just comes. The end of their, their struggle is his name is changed from Jacob to Israel. And if you read the scriptures, as you continue through the scriptures, sometimes he's Jacob, sometimes he's Israel. Has any of you ever noticed that? So their reference says of him, he's Jacob, he's Israel. He's Jacob, he's Israel. But where the story ends, it ends with him being Israel. Because somehow he dealt with jo Jacob. Now in the other corner, the other story that we read is of Simon Peter. The name Simon means a reed. A reed is just, you know, this little flimsy plant that is battered about by winds. It just moves with the winds. That was his nature. That was what he was called. Um, actually, fun fact. Do you guys like fun facts? Simon Peter, Simon the name, in the Greek means flat-nosed. And he's called Simon from Cyrene, and he had a flat nose. Cyrene was in current day Libya. Was he African? Probably. Flat-nosed lives came from Libya. I think so. But anyway, the main thing is I just love things like that because I'm like, yeah, we're in. Peter was, was African. <laughs> so anyway, um, he was called, his, he was, his identity was defined by weakness. He was defined by changeable, by a changeable character. Because you know what it's like being a reed? When the winds blow, you go wherever you, it is being blown. But from the moment that Jesus met him, the first time he met him, he said, you're not Simon, you're Peter. And Peter means rock. So he, looked, he cut through all of this and he said, you're a rock. And that was what Jesus gave him. He gave him the right identity. He said, you're not a reed, you are a rock. And then in the story that we've just read, Simon hits gold. How many of you know that sometimes you have this light bulb moment and you say stuff and you're wired and you're like clever and you've come across well and everybody's like, wow. <laughs> and then he's, he said, you are Messiah. You are the son of God. And everybody's like, whoa. Even Jesus, Messiah himself says, come on, Simon. Peter, you've, you are the rock. Now, this is what I'm talking about. You're not a reed. You're the rock. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> that was who God saw. Men saw Simon. God saw Peter. Men saw Jacob. God saw Israel. You see yourself a certain way. God sees woman of God, mighty val woman of valor, oh, instrument of God. God sees beyond 
what we look like to ourselves, what we look like to our siblings. I like to tell you stories about myself. So since I've got the mic, let me tell you about myself. I am so shy. I'm like the shyest person in the world. So growing up, I, I told you I was like super, super re reserved and super quiet. But you know, how many of you would define yourself as shy? Yeah, so shy people, really? <laughs> Let me tell you something about shy people. Some shy people are very good at covering up their shyness. Yeah, some shy people are very loud. But they're loud to cover up. Yeah, so sometimes you're doing all this out there, but in here you, you're dying. So, but I was not even like this. I was like, shy, shy, shy. I was so shy that when my family would go on family gatherings, like weddings and things like that, it's so funny. I'm not in the pictures. Why am I not in the pictures? I didn't used to go. Why would I not go? The effort of talking to people would give me a migraine. I'm not kidding you. Just the, the whole, I have to talk to people. Oh my God, I'm going to die. So, thank God for Jesus. <laughs> so, even when I came to the Lord, you know, God has to peel your layers up back one by one. And um, I was still really reserved and I would much rather not be at things. And um, my friends, my closest friends, behind my back, yeah, closest friends can talk behind your back. So my closest friend behind my back called me the mouse. Yeah, that was my name, the mouse. So... After God, you know, like years, I was years away from home, went to England when I was in my early 20s. And, you know, God just visited me and did some, some amazing things. And I came back and I told my friends, I'm preaching. And they're like, you what? You're preaching? Yeah, 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 I'm preaching. So they came and they sat in the congregation. So at the end of them, they came, two of them came together and they stood in front of me and they said, the mouse has become a lion. <laughs> yeah. So I want today to speak over you that the mouse is going to become a lion. And Simon is going to become Peter. And Jacob is going to become Israel. And we're going to get rid of the things that hold us back. And don't make us able to perform at the level that we need to be. So, um, where was I? We all have those two identities, the weak side. But let me talk to you a little bit about your weak side. Because your weak side, a lot of times, is actually testifying of where you're going. Your weak side is almost like the flip side of your strong side. So, for Jacob... His weak side was that he was grabbing. He was a supplanter. He was taking stuff. But what was that? What was that manifestation? That was actually his fighting spirit. And that fighting spirit was supposed to be being used in the place of prayer to prevail with God and, and change the hearts of men. But he was using it in the wrong way. That fighting thing was actually useful for the kingdom once it was harnessed. And so God looked at that thing and he said, I see that thing, but I don't see it as Jacob. I see it as Israel. I see it as a prince with God. I see it as your strength. I can take it and I can take it into the prayer room and you can fight battles in the prayer room and overcome. You are a prince with God. Um, Peter, Peter's weakness and what made him changeable was his mouth. You know what? A lot of these people that talk a lot, they're evangelists hiding in gossip.
Yeah. So Peter's problem is that he just kept getting things wrong. But it's because he just jumped in and spoke. Whatever was going on, Peter just jumped in and he spoke. And um, sometimes he got it right. Sometimes he got it wrong. Trust me, if you speak a lot, some of the things that you say are not are going to be dodgy. So sometimes it's good to measure your words a little bit. But God saw past that flimsy. One day I got it right. The other day I get it wrong. One day I'm, I'm, I'm a prince. One day I'm... And God said, I see a preacher in this one. I see a rock. I see that mouth. I'm going to use that mouth. I'm going to use it for my glory. Amen. We all have Simon inside of us. We all have Jacob inside of us. But we also have Israel. And we also have Peter. And God's focus is not on Simon. God's focus is not on Jacob. God's focus is on the inner you. God has an amazing way of looking past what we present as, and he sees the real you. God has a way of looking at Gideon, who's hiding, and he says, mighty man. And Gideon is looking behind and saying, who are they talking about? What, mighty man, me? And God says, yep, you, with you, I can fight a battle. God sees so much in you. God sees so much in you. Some of it has been hidden. You know, our identity sometimes gets corrupted because of the things that we go through, because of names that people have put on us, because of circumstances of life. But God is able to cut through all of that and cut through to who we really are and manifest us. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Behind that little j mousy person that you're sitting next to is a giant. Mm -hmm. Behind that person is an Israel. Behind them is a Peter, a rock. I want you to just testify to them for a minute and say, you are a mighty woman of God. You are a giant. You have hidden treasure. God is going to do some stuff with you. He just needs to cut through. Mm. Whatever our weakness is, in the master's hand, that weakness can become a strength. Whatever our shortcomings are, in the master's hand, that thing can become a strength. Now, I want just to focus for the closing minutes. How did they unlock? What was the process of unlocking the hidden gem? Was it hours of counseling? Years of training? How do you morph from that person that you are, that's hidden, that's hidden because of life, hidden because of things that have happened, a lot of times, our shyness or our withdrawal or our fears are based on real things that have happened that have locked us in a cocoon. And yes, I agree that you can teach past certain things. But I agree that some people can take counseling. But I've brought you these two guys because I really, really believe that what transforms us, what truly transforms us, is an encounter with God. An encounter with God does for you what hours of counseling cannot do. An encounter with God transforms you in an instant. There are encounters with God that I have had, which if I had not had them, I never would be standing here holding this mic. But because I bumped into him who created the Israel within me, him who created the Peter within me, he, by just meeting with him and encountering with him, he just sheds part of you off and you are transformed. Jacob, comes, let's just go through his story for a minute. Let's look at his encounter. He has had a really rough 20 years. 
He thought he was doing what he needed to do to get ahead in life. But it ended him up working for a father-in-law from hell. He, he meets his, his match and more. You know, sometimes for you to transform, you need to meet your match. He meets somebody who is twice the supplanter, twice the grabber, twice the thief, twice the trickster. And he is hurting because, you know what, even if it's your fault that you break up with somebody, you still hurt. And he's hurting from, he's not got any contact now with his brother. And he's in this house and he's being treated like I don't know what. He's struggled to get his two wives. He's struggled to get an income. He's worked for years without an income. He is tired, homesick, fed up. And do you know, sometimes the best of us comes out when we meet God at our lowest. He is homesick, he's tired, and God has given him a mission which scares the life out of him. God has said to him, go back to Esau. And every fiber of his being is frightened. Do you get the picture? He's walking, but he's scared. He's walking, but he's terrified. He has no idea what Esau is going to do to him. The last time he spoke to Esau, Esau said, let's bury our brother and you follow. So he's frightened. This could be a suicide mission. And so he's like, God, I'm at the end of myself. And I thank God for the things that have brought me to the end of myself. Because if I had not come to the end of myself, I never would have met God the way that I met God. There is something beautiful about the trials that we go through in life. You know, sometimes you look at people like you look at someone and you say they are such a prayer warrior. And you think they were born a prayer warrior. No, they were pushed against the wall and life pressed them into a corner. And they learned how to fight. Because when you push a mouse and you push a mouse, at a certain point you turn around and you say, e Enough! Anybody pushed against the corner finds strength somewhere. Yeah, so I lift up my hands and I thank God that God enabled me and God empowered me and God allowed me to go through the things I went through. I'm one of those people who used to think that if God loves you, life is easy. Anybody here like me? I used to think that when you come to the Lord, you know, we used to have a song in Uganda which says, I'm sailing, sailing, going to heaven. So I thought that you just sail, 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 sail. Whoa, and then I came to England. And I was, I had a very protective mom. And so my mom would never let us see trouble. She would never let us see. She did everything in her power. My dad died when we were very young. He was murdered. And my mom was very protective of us. So she didn't want us to experience pain. And she tried to make sure everything is cushy and comfortable for us. And then God told me, get up, go to England. I got up and went to England. Hey, immigrants. Ah. Like I'd never seen three quarters of this thing. I'd never known what it is like to not know where your dinner is coming from. I'd never known what it's like to not have anybody know your name or be able to say your name. I was just, you know, and then in addition to that, my first child came super premature. My firstborn was born 687 grams of weight at 26 point something weeks. And in those days, he's 28 now. In those days, he was touch and go. He was on the border of viable. And that whole experience shook me to the core because I was like, Jesus, I thought because I've loved you all my years, I thought you'd protect me. I thought you'd never let things come to me. I thought life would just be sailing. I never expected this to happen. 
but I would not be standing here. If I had not gone through those things, if I had not stood over my child and prayed until his heart started to beat again, if I had not stood there in the face of the doctors when they're telling me he'll never walk, he'll never talk, he'll never be able to do anything, and I had not learned how to go into my room and to say, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are a covenant keeper. You are able. You can do this thing. You can bring this child. And I stood there not because I'm strong, but some strength is within you. And sometimes you need some trouble to push it out of you. So uh, Jacob is at the end of himself. I came to speak to somebody who's nearly at the end of himself. You're, you're on the brink. You're saying, Lord, why have you allowed all these things? He has allowed them because he knows there's a lion inside of you. And those things are facilitating your breakthrough. You will not die in the battlefield. You will live to declare the goodness of the Lord. You will come out stronger. You will come out bigger. You will come out bolder. You're not going to die. You're going to see the glory of God. I speak over you, you will see the glory of God. That marriage did not come to kill you. It came to teach you how to pray. And you pray and you pray until you see the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God who meets you in that dark corner. He gets to this point where he's like, Jesus. Well, it wasn't Jesus. It was good. Jesus wasn't in the picture. But he's at the end of them himself. And they tell him, your brother Esau is coming. You know when trouble has come and come and now it's coming. <laughs> and he's like, he's coming how? And they said he has an army of like 400 men. Ay, ay, ay. He's going to wipe us all out. He is in panic mode. Let me tell you something about when you're in panic mode. You are quick to grab God. <laughs> you don't need to first see God descend from heaven and speak with a loud voice anything which looks like God. <laughs> so a man comes. A man. But when you're hungry, you're like, this may be my breakthrough. This is the one. You don't wait. You know, when you're not hungry, a man comes, you're like, ha, ah, first. Uh, explain, who are you? Uh, you're from God. Show us signs and wonders. No, 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 no. Jacob was past all of that. He was like, this may be my breakthrough right here. I am not even going to ask. I'm going to grab this person until he blesses me. But at the time that Jacob laid hold of the man. He had no idea. There was no guarantee. You know, when you're, when you're comfortable, you wait for guarantees. You're like, uh-huh. So this Pascal Grace, she's from where? Uh, what are her credentials? Who has she prayed for? And um, signs and wonders, where are they? Can you show us your CV? But my dear, when you're hungry, you smell God from afar. And you're like, eh, 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 eh. I think I can detect some God in there and I'm going to lay hold of this one and I'm not letting go until you bless me. He was at the end of himself and the thing, the battle took the whole night down. Don't ask me why God takes a long time on things. But one of my reasons, I think, is that it's taken you a long time to become Jacob. And so God needs to fight Jacob until Jacob is wrestled to the ground. So they wrestle and they wrestle. And Jacob says, I am not letting go. I am not letting go. My dear, when you're getting ready for your breakthrough and to come out of a place, you are persistent. You do not let go because you have no option but to hold on. And they battle until morning. And God gets hold of Jacob and he 
gets hold of his hip bone and he dislocates it. What is he doing? Because you, you're thinking in your head, ouch. But what he is doing is he's dislocating his strength in himself. He's taking away from him that um, confidence in self. And he's bringing him to a weak place. Because my dear, when we are weak, then we are strong. When we have run out of our own weakness, then we can lean on the everlasting arms. And we can experience the God of our strength. I thank God for weakness. I thank God that my weakness introduced me to God. And in that moment, in that battle, Israel is born. One encounter with God. One encounter unlocked the hidden Jacob. Unlocked the Israel that was locked in Jacob. Today, you just need to encounter God. You need an encounter, flesh on flesh. John says that which we have seen, which we have touched, we which we have handled. Let me tell you, when you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, when you've had an encounter with God, nobody can shake you on the thing that you're talking about. You cannot shake me. And whatever circumstances you throw at me, God is still God. I have met him. I have touched him. He has touched me. He has dislocated located me. He has made me a different person. He has taken away my old nature. He has given me a new nature. How can you argue with that? And then Simon, Simon Peter was at the end of himself as well. Simon's mouth <laughs> had got him into problems after problems after problems. Tell your neighbor, if you have, a, 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 you know, a gossipy tongue or a loud mouth, don't worry, you're in good company. Even Peter was like that. There's hope. There's hope. There's hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's hope. <laughs> it, we're all, we're good. <laughs> so Simon, he was one of those blustery guys. You know, people who can talk their way out of anything. You throw it at me, I'll get an answer quick. I'm quick. On, like, whatever you say, I've got an answer straight away. But at the point, now we're talking about Jesus calling him the rock. And do you know that until Jesus dies and until Pentecost, Simon Peter continues to be called Simon Peter. You read the scriptures. Because today he's Simon, tomorrow he's Peter. Today he's Simon, tomorrow he's Peter. He keeps being changeable. And then life just throws one of those curveballs at him. He finds himself in this situation that he didn't imagine. His master, who he has followed, who he left his everything for, and he's followed him for three years, has not just talked about death. He, it wasn't an allegory or it wasn't a proverb. It actually happened. He died. And just before he died, he said, Peter, you're going to be sifted. Stuff is going to happen to you. But be strong. I've prayed for you. And when you're done, encourage. You encourage your saints. <laughs> ah, I just love it. When you're done, you encourage your saints. Whatever you're going through, you go through. He has prayed for you. When you're done, encourage somebody. So, they're in this, he's, he said to, to, to um, Jesus, nah, me, I won't deny you. Because Jesus has told him, you're going to deny me once, twice, three times. And he's like, no, 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 you don't understand me. I'm loyal to my friends. I stand by my people. Wherever my people are, I'm there. Wherever you go, I'm going to be there. He's rapping to Jesus about how faithful he's going to be. I'm the man. Remember, I'm the rock. You're the one who said, I'm the rock. So if I'm the rock, how am I going to deny you three times? Remember, bro, I'm the rock. And Jesus is like, yeah, 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 yeah. I know all that, but you are going to fall. You are going to deny me. 
and he watches himself. Have you ever done something where you're watching yourself and you're like, Grace, stop it. Are you actually, are you, is this actually happening? Are you actually, what? How did you get here? And it's a little girl who comes to him. You know the embarrassment of you fell, but you fell over a small thing. My friend used to say that if you're going to die, you die of some posh illness. Don't die because you fell over a bicycle. You know, like small stuff. He fell because of the words of a servant. It was a servant. That's what, what gets him. He's like, man, I'm supposed to be the rock. All my brethren are looking at me and they're like, rock? And the pain of it. You know, when you disappoint yourself, it's easy even to forgive other people. Forgiving yourself is not easy. And he's struggling. Jesus comes back and Jesus speaks to him, speaks into his life and says, um, Simon, do you love me? And he says, I love you. Simon, do you love me? He says, I love you, Simon. But you know what? Your best friend is asking you three times, do you love me? Do you know how that feels? It's like he still remembers. He remembers what I've done to him. And he's still in that. And I don't know how, how was he looking at his brethren. You know, coming back to church when you've done something and everybody else was like, you know what Peter did? You guys, Peter just denied the Lord. And he had to come and sit amongst his brethren. And the Bible says that Jesus then left them and they go to the upper room. Hmm. The Peter who goes to the upper room is called Simon Peter because he's still got the weak side and the strong side and they're struggling and he's at the bottom of himself. But I, as I say, the bottom of yourself is a good place. So today, if you're in that place, it's a good place. So he comes into this place and Jesus says, you guys just wait because the Holy Spirit is coming. And when the Holy Spirit comes and his power comes upon you, you guys will then be ready. And the Bible says they were in the upper room and tongues of fire came and fell upon them. And these guys who were hiding, hiding because they had a real reason why, because they could die out on the streets, suddenly power fills them. Power fills Simon Peter. Power fills him to such an extent that the Peter who could not talk to one servant girl stands up and speaks to 3,000 men who are after his life. He has suddenly transformed from Simon to Peter by an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And he stands up and he preaches the gospel. Do you know, I kid you not, that from that time you read your scriptures, they call him because he is the rock. And today, God wants to take the Jacob out and manifest the Israel. God wants to take the Simon out and manifest the Peter. God wants to take the hidden you, the hidden gem, the hidden giant, the one who is able to take the world. God wants to take the lion out of the mouse. Wants to get rid of the mouse and produce the lion. How many of you are ready? What it takes is hunger for an encounter with God. And let me tell you this encounter with God, you choose it yourself. And some of you are already at that place. Even now, when I'm talking, you can feel it in your spirit. This is my moment. And you know that you need to just bump into the presence of God right now. And God is going to do something amazing to shift your life. There is a hidden you. There is a hidden person inside of you. And the Holy Spirit wants to unlock your hidden identity. We're out of time. I want us to pray. I don't know what is your chosen position of prayer. Whether you want to stand, lie on the floor, or do what. But we are sisters together in the house of God. But we want to do business with God. And some of you can feel this in your belly. You know that 
this is my moment. I need to get hold of God. I need to grab hold of the one who is able to unlock the hidden me, the hidden me. So can we just forget about protocol and programs for a minute and let us just come into the presence of God? Can we do that? Can we just skip everything? Because this is a key time. I don't want us to joke around with this. I want us to pray. So let's choose our positions and let's pray. Begin to call out to God. The Bible talks of a man called Bartimaeus who noticed that it was his season and that God was passing by it. And he was like, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. He just lifted up his voice because that was all he had. And God is waiting for us to come to that place where we can wrestle with God and say, God of encounters, God of power, God of miracles, God of transformation. God of Jacob, God that is able, I ask you in Jesus' name, I'm coming, Lord, because there is things that are hidden inside of me, but I've been trapped, oh Lord God, I've been trapped, I've been trapped in what I'm not, there is more to me, there is more to my life, there is more to what you want to do, there is more to my life, oh God, I come before you in the name of Jesus, just begin to call out, call out, call out to the God who meets with his people in the dark of night, to the God who meets with his people when they are at their lowest, to the God who meets with us when we are at the end of ourselves. Call out, call out, call out, call out. Call out to the God who can lift us up from our weakness. Call out to the God who can transform us. Shanderebo sakarababayasa. Remo yesenereba karabazandaraba korobo. Just one encounter with you, Jesus. Just one encounter with you, O oh Holy Spirit. All we need is your power. Kenerebo sanderebo shanarabakasa. All we need is your power. All we need is an encounter with the King of Kings. All we need is an encounter with the Lord of Lords. When we see you, Lord God, we see who we are meant to be. When we see you, Lord, we see who we are meant to be. When we see you, when we bump into the power of the Holy Spirit. Let your fire fall on us, O oh God, and burn away the chaff. Let your fire fall on us and unlock the hidden me. Ha. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit. Just raise up your hands. There are some people that God is already touching and you're, you've, you've got tears in your heart, you've got tears in your eyes and I just want to take a minute to pray with you because God is already doing something with you. So if that's you, can we, ladies, is that all right? I'm just going to take a minute to pray with people. Yeah. Um, if that's you and you already feel that God is doing something powerful in your life, you can feel, especially those who have a manifestation of tears, just come quickly to the front. We're going to pray for just one minute. Just as, we, as you come to the front, just raise your, eye, your hands. And God just gave me that sign of tears that, 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 God, that God is just going to move on the lives of those that have tears and are crying out to God. Just continue to cry out to God because he hears you. And this moment is like a special moment. I'm, I just want you to just 
be in the moment. Just be in the moment. Just allow your spirit to engage with God. Just allow the Holy Spirit to wash over you. Allow his presence to wash over you. Allow the anointing of God to fall on you afresh. And just break, break, break everything that has held you back. The spirit of the living God is upon you. And he's breaking yokes. He's breaking yokes. He is breaking yokes. The spirit of the living God. Yeah, worship team, you can go ahead. The spirit of the living God is breaking yokes of you. Just begin to engage with the Holy Spirit. Some of you are experiencing trembling. That is the Holy Spirit just encountering with you. Press in, press in just for a few more minutes. Press in for a few more minutes. This could transform your life. Yes, we call on you, Holy Spirit, God of encounters. God of encounters. God that sets free the captive. As you're there, just invite the Holy Spirit. Invite his power. Invite his power to just come all over you. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is just all over you. Just receive, 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 receive. God is breaking, breaking you past, past, past the barrier. God is breaking you into what he wants of you. In Jesus' name, I call forth the woman of God. Spirit of God, Spirit of God, Spirit of God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for these formidable women, yes. Yes. The woman of God to break past, break past, break past, break past. Yes, I am. Who the Yes, yes, yes. The Spirit of God is upon you in so much power. Holy Spirit, thank you for your anointing. Thank you for the anointing upon this life. Thank you for the anointing upon this life. 